Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Enrique Tejedor. I uh, work at CERN, in particular in a, in a group that is called SFT, uh, that takes care of software development and support for the experiments at CERN. And uh, I wanted to tell you about an interactive data analysis platform that we have at CERN that is called SWAN, which uh, physicists can use to do uh, data analysis by offloading also computations to Spark clusters. And I will present a couple of use cases of uh, groups that are already using this platform uh, to do analysis with Spark uh, at CERN. But first, I will start with a brief introduction uh, to, to CERN. CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It was founded more than 60 years ago already uh, with the mission of doing fundamental research in, in physics. So we, we study the basic components of matter. We study particles, how they interact with each other, and what are the forces that bring them together, uh, because we want to know the fundamental laws of, of nature. And to do this research, uh, actually we use very complex scientific instruments, like, for instance, the, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the LHC is a particle accelerator. It's actually the most powerful particle accelerator in the, in the world. It's actually built, uh, in the, as, you hear, as you see here in this picture, in the Franco-Swiss border. So you have there Lake Geneva and the Alps. Uh, and it's built in a tunnel that is uh, 27 kilometers long. Uh, and inside this tunnel, inside this ring, uh, what we do is we accelerate particles at close to the speed of light. And then we make them collide against each other. And we observe what happened in, in those collisions. Um, so actually, the collisions, they, they happen in particular points of this ring, which is what you see on the right of this image. These are called detectors, and they have all these layers of sensors that will capture what happened in the, in the collisions in the LHC. Um, so the, the LHC has led to several discoveries. Perhaps the most famous one is the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. Actually, you see here in the picture uh, Peter Higgs, who together with uh, Professor Engler, they actually predicted the existence of this particle in the 1960s already, but only was demonstrated empirically by the LHC in 2012. Um, but uh, particle physics aside, uh, CERN was also the birthplace of the World Wide Web. Uh, so actually the web was invented by this man in the picture, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, when he was working at CERN in 1989. Uh, so he basically needed some way to share uh, information with his colleagues. Uh, so he put up this next server, the first, first web server ever, at this URL, info.cern.ch. And actually, if you are curious, you can still go to this URL, and you will see the first website ever that uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, created, which was hosted uh, at CERN. So at CERN, we are a very international crowd. We are more than uh, 15,000 scientists. Some of them work uh, at CERN. They are raised at CERN. Some of them, they work in other institutions uh, collaborating uh, with CERN. And we come from more than 100 uh, nationalities. So how do we actually do data processing and analysis at CERN? Um, this slide actually summarizes how we do it. It's the whole pipeline that data follows at CERN. Uh, so we start with the detectors, so where the collisions happen. Uh, this generates a lot of data. This generates actually one petabyte per second of raw data. Uh, but of course, this data needs to be filtered. Uh, so we, we do a process of filtering this data by hardware with FPGAs and, and software with some physics algorithms. And then we are left with uh, one petabyte a day of data, so from one petabyte a second to one petabyte a day that we actually store in our mass storage system that is called EOS. So this is raw physics data, raw collision data that then we need to reconstruct. So reconstructing means that we, we need to find out what were the particles that came out of this collision and we, we need to know what were the trajectories, the tracks that they, that they followed, so that we, we know exactly we have a complete picture of, the, of each of the collisions. So we do this reconstruction, we generate the reconstructed data, uh, which is already in, in root format. I will explain in a minute what uh, root is. And then this data it goes through further processing and skimming that results in some analysis formats, which is actually what the physicists will use to do their final uh, data analysis and get physics uh, results. 
So this is the whole picture of how data flows uh, at CERN. Um, and how do physicists analyze this data? So they basically, what they do is they use this data analysis framework that is called ROOT, which is widely used in high energy physics. Uh, it's a software toolkit uh, that you can use to do data processing, statistical analysis, visualization, I.O., uh, and storage of data. And actually, now we are close to one exabyte of data that is stored in root format, data coming out from the LHC uh, all over these years since the creation of the LHC. Now we are uh, close to this one exabyte. And, and this root format is actually it's a binary format, compressed, and uh, it allows physicists to store uh, data in a columnar layout that looks a little bit like this. Uh, so this is a typical root data set. Uh, it can be stored in one or more files. Uh, and it has this layout where the, the rows are the collisions, the collision events, um, and the columns, they are physics entities or physics quantities that are related to that particular collision events. And actually, the collision events, they are independent between them. So you can just process them in parallel, no problem. They are stochastically independent. And uh, although this looks like a table, actually uh, each of these physics entities, they can be uh, complex C++ objects like an electron or muon. So it's actually more a nested structure that looks more like a tree, more than, than like, a, like a table that is uh, shown here. Um, so in order to process all the data that was coming out from the LHC, um, CERN initiated the creation of the LHC computing grid. Uh, so it started in 2002. And uh, it's basically used by physicists to submit their jobs and process the, their data. It's uh, formed by many computer centers uh, all over the world uh, that contribute with their resources in, in terms of storage and processing resources, computing resources. And it's running 24-7 uh, all year long. So this is actually what the physicists used to uh, run their computations, and the typical workflow that they, that they follow is they have some data set that they want to process. Um, so they take this data set and they create ranges, and for each of these ranges of events, so these are collision events, uh, they, they launch a job in the grid. A job will process a range. Then these jobs, they, they write some partial results, and then there will be afterwards a merge job that will merge these, uh, these partial results. So this is typically how, how it works, how physicists work. Uh, this is a, a model that has been used over the years and has allowed to uh, analyze tons of data. But there are huge challenges that are coming ahead. Um, so in a few years, we will have this uh, very important upgrade of the LHC, which is called HLLHC, or High Luminosity LHC. Uh, high Luminosity basically means more collisions. And more collisions means more data. So uh, we estimate that we will collect 30 times more data than the exabyte that we have already collected in this HLLHC period. So it's a, it's a huge increase, right? And this poses a big challenge for software and computing because if we see the estimated technology evolution until that year, until 2025, uh, and, and the data processing needs that we will have then, it's clear that software needs to bridge this, this gap, okay? So, we are working on that. Uh, and actually, I, I showed this already. This is data pipeline. And all the stages in this pipeline at CERN, they will all be pushed by this data increase, all of them. Uh, but in this presentation, I will focus on, on one of them, which is the, the final uh, data analysis uh, that physicists do. So in that sense, I wanted to introduce to you this interactive data analysis platform that we have set up at CERN. And this, uh, this platform is actually called SWAN, the SWAN service. So it's a service for web-based analysis. Uh, the idea is that with this service, um, people connect to it, they authenticate with their CERN credentials with their browser and they get an interactive computing interface based on, on Jupyter Notebooks where they can run uh, their analysis. Um, it's, it also allows, and we will see it in a minute, easy sharing of results. So you can do collaborative analysis. You can produce your notebooks and share it easily with, with others. And it's integrated with the, the whole ecosystem of, of CERN resources with 
technologies that are already familiar to, to physicists uh, at CERN, that they use uh, every day for, for their work. And I'm talking about technologies uh, in terms of software, storage, and, and computing. So any service like this, to start with software, any service like this needs to provide the software that physicists or that users in general need, because otherwise they will not use it, right? So for that, our choice uh, was uh, very clear. Uh, we, we provide access in this, in this service to CBMFS, which is a distributed file system that we have at CERN, where all the experiment software, all the physics packages that our scientists need, they are there installed, so they can use them from Swan. Uh, then another important pillar is storage. Uh, a service like this needs to provide access to data, otherwise users will not use it. They need to find the data that they, they, they want to use. Uh, and for that, we make accessible the data on this EOS mass storage system that we have at CERN. So all the LHC data is uh, put there. So we need to make it accessible. And also we have this sync and share part, which is called CERNbox. It's a little bit like Dropbox at CERN, uh, which is um, just user files. Uh, user accounts with uh, some user files that they also uh, want to have accessible. And then finally, computing, we do it with these interface Jupyter notebooks and with Apache Spark. So we allow physicists to offload computations from Swan to Spark clusters that are located uh, at CERN. Um, this is actually how the, the whole architecture of the service looks like. Uh, so I, as a, as a user, I connect to this web portal where I authenticate, um, and then I'm given a session, and inside this session, I have accessible all the software that I need from CVMFS and all the data that I need, collision data that is stored on EOS or on my private space on, on my server box, which is actually my home directory uh, in this service. Um, then the interface is the notebooks. Uh, I guess you are more or less familiar with it. So it's this interactive computing interface uh, where you can combine different types of data. You can have text explaining what you are doing. Uh, you can have code that you can run and you get back the results, which can be text or graphics. Uh, everything is uh, in, the same, in the same document. And people can create their notebooks. They can create projects that contain these notebooks plus some input data plus maybe output data. Uh, and then they can actually share these projects with other people. So from the Swan interface, they can go and they can say, okay, I have this project with my notebooks and other types of data, and now I, I click on it, and I want to share it with this guy and this guy. And then these other people, they will see it also appearing in their Swan interface that someone shared this project with them. They will be able to click on it, inspect the notebooks, maybe rerun them, modify them, and reshare them again uh, if they want. So it really enables this collaborative analysis that uh, we really need uh, at CERN. And then the last ingredient of this platform is actually the integration with Spark. Uh, because we, we didn't want that our users were restricted to only the resources of their session, which is actually encapsulated in, in a Docker container. Uh, we wanted them to be able to, to go beyond these, uh, these resources and to spawn computations elsewhere uh, to an external cluster. And we actually started doing this with Spark. So now in Swan, since the beginning of this year in production, uh, we allow users from a notebook to submit uh, their, their Spark jobs to our uh, Spark clusters at CERN. And uh, so these jobs, they will generate tasks. And of course, these tasks, they will also have access to the data on EOS and to the software that is installed on, on CVMFS, right? Because we really want to replicate the same environment, let's say, on the client side in my notebook and on the, uh, on the Spark uh, executors. Um, so what users typically do when they want to use Spark, uh, they, they go to, to Swan, they, uh, they have this interface to connect to a Spark cluster. Uh, they can also provide some configuration, like a uh, number of executors, a memory per executor, etc. And when they are happy with this, they click on connect, so they, they can connect to this particular cluster. And once they, they are connected, um, they can already, from their notebook, they can already submit Spark jobs, um, uh, like you see in this picture. And when, when, you do, uh, when you do that from Swan, automatically, in the output of the cell of the notebook, you will see this display appearing. It's an interactive uh, JavaScript display that shows you the progress of your jobs, uh, that shows you your tasks, where they are running, and if they failed, why they failed, so you can do debugging with it. Um, 
And actually, this was very important uh, for our users because here you are kind of mixing two different environments. You are mixing a Jupyter Notebook, which is something interactive. So whenever I run, I type something on my notebook, I expect that immediately I get a result. You are mixing this with an Apache Spark job that can take some time to run. So you really need to provide some means for the user to really know what's going on on the other side. Uh, and this is what we do with this display. Um, Actually, it's, uh, it was uh, in the scope of a Google Summer of Code project, so it's uh, open source. You can download the, the code of this Spark Monitor if you, if you are interested. It's available. So after describing uh, this uh, Swan service, how uh, it combines storage and software at CERN with processing power with Spark, now I'm going to explain a couple of use cases that are already using uh, this, uh, this service. Uh, the first use case is about uh, analyzing physics data, so collision data coming out from the LHC. Um, and first I wanted to talk about uh, this R data frame that we have. So in root we have our, our own data frame, it's called R data frame, and in a way it's similar to the Spark uh, data frame. So it promotes this um, high-level declarative analysis model where you express your computation in terms of operations on, on, a, on a given data set. So you can see in this uh, small code example how some operations might be uh, familiar to you, like you can define filters on your data, uh, you can um, uh, add new columns uh, to, your, to your data set. These are typical operations you can also do in, in, in Spark. But there are some operations that they are specifically tailored for our use case, like um, typically physicists, they want to, uh, to make sense of the collision data. They create histograms or graphs, and these actually actions that we have in our R data frame that generate these entities that then physicists, they will use in their, in their analysis. And another cool thing that you can see here, actually this is a, it's Python code, but the, the strings that you pass to the filter or define, actually this is uh, C++, because uh, our data frame and root, they are implemented in C++, so Python is only the interface. We have an interface for, for Python users. But here, what we do is, root has a, a C++ interpreter, which is called Kling, uh, that is actually linked to LLVM and Clang, a compiler, and it is able to take this string, this expression, and dynamically wrap it in a function, and just in time compile it and run it. Okay. Uh, and in this case, it's a, it's a trivial cut, but it could be a more complex cut, like uh, in the case of physics, we have functions with uh, many lines of code that uh, define our, our cuts, right? So we could actually also do this uh, from here. Then with this R data frame, we wanted to exploit Spark. R data frame now, it can run uh, on a single computer, also exploiting all the cores of that computer, multi-thread parallelization implicitly. But we, we wanted that uh, an R data frame application, an R data frame analysis, would be able also to uh, exploit all the nodes in a, in a cluster, and in particular the Spark clusters that we have at CERN. So what we did is we developed a, a backend for Spark uh, uh, in our data frame that is able to distribute this computation graph that is generated by our data frame to all the nodes of, of, of the cluster. And this is actually how, how it works uh, underneath. So the, the Spark backend, uh, it knows the data set you are working on, um, and it will basically divide it in ranges, and it will create, a, with Spark, a map reduce workflow uh, where the mappers, they will use the, the root I.O. Uh, libraries to remotely read data from the EOS uh, storage system, which is where our data is. Uh, so every mapper will read a range with root, and then it will apply the computation graph of our data frame. We'll generate uh, some results, histograms, etc. And then this will be reduced into a, into a final result. And uh, here I just wanted to uh, highlight that we, we are able, with this system, to run analysis that are coded in C++ with Spark through Python bindings, so through PyRoot and, Py, and PySpark uh, as well. Um, so we actually, uh, very recently, we, we tried this on, on a real analysis code coming from an, a CERN experiment that is called Totem. Uh, so TOTEM is an LHC experiment. Uh, what we did is we took uh, a code that they had, uh, that they used in their greed jobs and bad jobs, 
and we, we, we converted it to uh, the R data frame form, so this declarative uh, analysis model, and then we run it with the Spark backend. Uh, in the, uh, actually, the, the input data set was a 4.7 terabyte that was stored on EOS, and this is collision data from the totem experiment, real data that they, they used uh, uh, to actually publish a paper uh, before. Uh, and we launched it from, from Swan, from a notebook, to a dedicated Spark cluster that, that we had. And this is the, uh, the scaling, the preliminary results of scaling that we got. Um, here, actually, the, the application is basically IO bound, so there's not a lot of computation going on in the mappers because we are basically filling histograms. Uh, so clearly, the, actually, the resource utilization could be, could be improved. But the point that I wanted to make here, which I think is important, is that for the maximum number of resources that we were using here, their analysis run on the entire data set in a few minutes. And when, when the same totem colleagues, they run this with batch or grid jobs, uh, it normally took for them like from several to many hours to run the thing on the entire data set. And although we cannot compare it because these are different infrastructure, this is a Spark dedicated cluster and the other one is the grid. Um, for physicists, it's important. So physicists, they are interested in physics, right? This is no surprise. So whatever system brings them to physics results faster, it's more likely that they will adopt it, that they will change the way they do things to adopt this new thing. And I think these results, although they can be improved, they are encouraging uh, these people to continue exploring the, uh, the Spark uh, way. Um, so now I'm going to, before finishing my presentation, I'm going to talk about another use case that is exploiting the Swan service at CERN. Uh, to run with Spark. So this is not physics data anymore. This is not collision data. This is actually log data, uh, controls data that comes from the LHC, because the, the LHC is a highly sophisticated machine. So uh, when it's on operation, you really need to know what's going on. You need to control with a lot of devices that are installed in this uh, LHC, uh, different parameters to understand uh, if everything is going well or not. Right. Uh, actually, there's a, a whole team of people dedicated to that, to operate the machine. And what they have is they have thousands of devices installed on the LHC uh, with hundreds of properties each. I don't know, temperatures, pressures, uh, properties of the proton beams, uh, many, many things that they need to control and that they need to, to monitor. So um, they actually log all these things, all the uh, information from the, from the devices, and they, uh, they actually, uh, recently, they started even logging more devices, and they increased the frequency at which they, they log. Uh, and they saw this uh, kind of explosion in the um, uh, volume of data that they need to store. Actually, now they are storing 1.5 terabyte a day of logging data that uh, comes from the LHC. And this made them realize that their current system that they used to analyze this data uh, was not uh, usable anymore. They had this system based on SQL databases that was not uh, scaling anymore. Uh, it was slow for them to extract data from, from this system and analyze it. So they are actually moving already now. So actually for this team of people, the problem is already here. I talked about the physics data before and I talked about uh, uh, 2025, but these people have the problem now and they are already moving to a system where they don't dump the data on SQL databases anymore. They, they pump the data into HBase and, and HDFS. And on top, they use uh, Spark to extract and, and process uh, that data. And in addition, uh, they, they do this from Swan. So Swan is the entry point for these people to, um, to uh, process their, their logged data. And they are, uh, on a daily basis, they are producing these notebooks where they use Spark to query uh, their data or to process their data. Uh, they get back some results. They use the software that is installed on Swan uh, in order to analyze this data. Um, and they produce these notebooks that they can share uh, between each, each other. So they really rely on Swan as, as the entry point to accessing these uh, Spark resources. So I'm, I come to the end of my presentation just as a summary. Um, so I have already mentioned all these challenges that we have ahead uh, at CERN. Uh, we are seeing uh, how we will have in the future this increase in physics data. We already have an increase uh, in controls data, and this is pushing software uh, at CERN uh, a lot. 
Uh, so we are we are looking, of course, outside and seeing what uh, what other people do, what is used in industry in the uh, big data field. Uh, but I would say that the adoption of Spark and other technologies uh, coming from big data it's still in early stages because uh, in the end we have all these traditional ways of running our, our code that had been very successful. Uh, and we have a large code base of experiment software that uh, does things in a, in a given way. So this, of course, cannot change overnight. Uh, and it's not only the code, it's also programmers. Uh, programmers, they are used to programming in a way, physicists. Uh, and it's difficult to change the mindset that they have, like promote these high, higher level programming models. So now you are going to express your analysis with data frame uh, style instead of just doing an, an explicit loop on your collision events, right? Uh, or pushing computations to data. Instead of getting all your, all your data to your machine and then analyzing it in your machine, you, are, you need to try to push computations to data. This, is, this all takes time uh, to, to adopt, right? Uh, but we know that we need to bridge this gap between what will be the technology evolution and our data processing needs, and we are working on that. And this is why we are going ahead with this project, with this uh, Swan service, to combine interactive analysis with a nice interface uh, where people can easily offload computations to, uh, to external resources to plug these resources and use them to run their, their analysis and where we promote these uh, higher level uh, programming models. This is all I wanted to say just to finish with. Um, there will be a couple more presentations by Luca and Prashant about uh, CERN and Spark, so uh, if you are interested, uh, stay tuned. Thank you. You mentioned that Swan has the capabilities to share uh, notebooks and all this. Um, yes. Could you give some more details about this sure. function? Let me go back. Yes, so um, the idea is that Swan has a home directory. So when you log into Swan, your home directory is your CERN box, where, where all your files are. Uh, and CERNBox has the capability of sharing. It provides sharing primitives. So what Swan does is actually uses an API of CERNBox so that from this uh, graphical interface, you can go and say, okay, so this project, which is actually a folder that contains notebooks and other types of data, I want to share it with these people. And then these people, they will see it, thanks to CERNBox, they will see it appearing also under, under Swan. Yeah. And another thing that you can do with CERNBox is uh, it's a little bit like Dropbox, so you can install a client in your laptop and you can synchronize the files from the cloud to your laptop as well. So whatever notebook you produce in, uh, in Swan, you can have it synchronized automatically to your laptop if you want to inspect it locally, for sure. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask uh, how, uh, like, uh, about the level of isolation uh, between the uh, user and the, uh, like the Spark cluster. So, is uh, the cluster launched per user session, or how is it managed? Um, no, although that's an option that we want to explore. So, what happens is that um, so your session is running on a on a container in in some uh, machines that we have for Swan, and then there are uh, physical Spark clusters. At CERN, there are, I think, three or four of them uh, that you can select. And, well, it works with Kerberized access. So since you have, you're authenticated with Swan, you have your credentials, you can actually uh, submit computations uh, to them. It's a, it's a separate infrastructure. It's just that we made this link between, between the two. So they are long running. They are not like ad hoc created, destroyed. No. The, these ones are long running. Actually, there is uh, one of them is uh, dedicated only for these people that uh, process the logs of the LHC, only for them. But it's true that uh, it's in our plans to see if we can, on demand, you go there and you say, okay, I, I want uh, some cluster uh, with these many executors, and it doesn't have to, to be a static one. It's created on demand. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions for this session. I'm sure Enric will be happy to talk to you offline. Thanks very much. Thank you.